Proverbs chapter 15 from the Authorized Version of the Scriptures. Please get an Authorized Version of the Scriptures and please follow me along. Just two verses to start here. Verses 16 and 17 in Proverbs chapter 15 from the Authorized Version of the Scriptures. Follow me along. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger a piece of strife. We read verse 18 as well. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Hmm. Go to Revelation chapter 17. This video today, people, is going to be bombarding you with information. Going to literally. <laughs> Got a lot of stuff we're going to be looking at today. Going to literally bombard you with information. Okay? And I, and I, have, to, I have to address this very quickly. At the outset of this, you know, the more you threaten me, the more I'm going to react by speaking out against your system. The more of these coadjutors and infiltrators you send to try to worm their way into our hearts, the more I'm going to speak out against your system. So, just so you know, you can continue to threaten me all you want. The more you threaten me, the more I'm going to come out against your system. Just so you know, okay? Big part of people, I had to say that, brethren. Revelation chapter 17, we are going to be looking at very quickly here, a video by JFK, a, a excerpt from a speech where he was warning people about the Jesuit order. Um, people like to take this uh, part of the speech that JFK gave, John F. Kennedy gave, and say, oh, he's talking about the Masons. No, he was talking about the Jesuits. Because when it comes to JFK, John F. Kennedy, let's get some, let's get some stuff out there right away. Number one, John F. Kennedy was an adulterer and a fornicator. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. He was an adulterer and a fornicator. He had an affair with uh, Marilyn Monroe. Number two, John F. Kennedy was a Catholic. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. But see, on to the Catholics, specifically the Jesuit order, John F. Kennedy was especially odious because he was, he, is, he was known as what is a liberal Catholic. And those of you pre-Vatican II Catholics, you know exactly what that is. And the moment uh, I say to you, John F. Kennedy, you as a pre-Vatican II Catholic, it gets your blood to boil, doesn't it? Doesn't it? And why was JFK so odious to Catholics? Number one, he wanted to run the uh, government of the United States in accordance with the Constitution. And he was a Democrat, okay? Back then, when the Democrats were not necessarily as they are today, for surely, Democrats, okay? But he was a Democrat. He wanted to uh, run this nation in accordance <laughs> with that thing, okay? But also, too, the thing that made him most odious and grievous was that JFK was against the Federal Reserve Bank. He wanted to take an, um, power away from the Jesuit order, the Federal Reserve Bank, and the Federal Reserve Bank here in America, that is the Pope's bank, the Jesuit's bank. I'm gonna prove that to you today. I'm gonna prove that to you today, okay? 
But he wanted to take that away from the Jesuits and put uh, everything into the Treasury of the United States and have the Treasury of the United States printing out currency that was backed by gold and silver. As whereas today, the currency here, the, see this Masonic thing here, the dollar bill, okay? You're going to see the thumbnail, okay? But see this, yeah? See, see where it says that? Federal Reserve, okay? You see that? What does that mean? This is a note printed by the Jesuit order given on to us Americans. And they call this the reserve currency of the world? Oh boy. But see, Kennedy wanted to get away from that and have the U.S. Treasury print currency. See, because without the uh, Federal Reserve Bank, there are no wars. There's no World War I, there's no World War II. So, while America, its founding fathers were in fact Freemasons, like Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, I'm going to show you the proof of that, okay? They were Freemasons. Our ancestors, the Puritans, who were Calvinistic, okay? Those, that was a different story. But see, our founding fathers here in America were Freemasons. And as you can see in the thumbnail, and we're going to get into this a little bit more, the marks of Freemasonry are right there. Right there. But, when we get into this, go to Revelation chapter 17. Okay? Revelation chapter 17. There are those out there who like to say that it's the Masons that rule everything. The Masons are a group that is controlled and operated by the Jesuit order. I'm going to prove that to you. Okay? But, the scripture tells us who the true enemy is. It's Satan, obviously. But, Revelation chapter 17. Please follow me along in the scriptures. Not the Bible. The scriptures. The King James Version. Revelation chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Roman Catholicism refers to their church buildings as her. They refer to it as Mother Church. Okay. Remember, Catholics worship the Queen of Heaven, Semiramis their version of the Catholic Mary, which is not the scriptural Mary, okay? They also uh, worship their Peter, who is Jupiter, okay? They also worship flesh, you know, the little uh, round skin suit thing, cookie. <laughs> yeah, they also worship flesh. But they refer to themselves as Mother Church, okay? Okay? And look at this, verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Okay? These uh, world leaders, where do they go to? Do they go to have an audience with the head rabbi in Israel? No. No. Are they going to a Masonic lodge to... Uh, have a meeting with the headmaster of the Masons. Well, they kind of do because I'm sure uh, both Francis and Sosa are uh, Masons themselves, of course. But who do they go to? They go to Rome. They go to the Pope. They go to the Vatican. Okay? They go to the Vatican. The Vatican, through the Jesuit order, runs virtually everything on earth today. They control all these organizations, from the Freemasons to the, um, to, to the well, the Illuminati. They were created by the Jesuits, uh, Adam Weishaupt, okay? But they control religion, they control media, they control the healthcare system, and they control the money, okay? But 
All nations have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Okay? And all these uh, political leaders, they go to Rome. They go to Rome. Okay? Let's continue this. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now the colors of the Vatican. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, and having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Okay? There are those of you out there who will be, well, no, no, the Vatican's colors are white and gold. That's the front of it. When you see the procession of the bishops and cardinals, it's scarlet and purple. Purple and scarlet. And look at this. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls and having a golden cup in her hand. You know, the wine that they'd use that magic abracadabra hocus pocus transubstantiation on and turn that little cookie that you Catholics worship so much. By the way, I found one uh, of you like this. So I'm going to use it as a thumbnail in a previous uh, video coming up. Keep an eye out for it, buddy. Okay. But, you know, they use transubstantiation to turn the cookie into flesh and the wine cup into the blood. Okay? Yeah. And look at all the glamour, the glitz, and the showbiz of Roman Catholicism. Okay? Let's continue. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The mother of harlots. That's Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism is the Babylonian religion repackaged for you people today. Okay? All the saints are pagan deities with Christian names on them. Saturnalia. What people call Christ Mass. Okay? With the, with the thing of the Lords of Misrule and stuff like that. Okay? Easter. Astarte. Okay? These are pagan holidays, holidays attributed with Christian names. Okay? That's what Constantine did. Okay? Understand that? But, remember, in fact, yes, Roman Catholicism, they're Christian. They're not the church of the living God. They're Christian. Okay? So, Mystery Babylon the Great, because Catholicism is repackaged, revamped. For today's modern people, it is the Baalite Babylonian religion. Okay? From the Satanic, Babylonian, e uh, Egyptian, Roman Catholic Trinity, to the Eucharist, with the cup, to the hierarchical system in Rome, to the confession that go the confessional that goes all the way back to Babylon. Okay? Roman Catholicism is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. It's Rome, people. And the Masons are controlled by her and her Jesuit order. Okay? Let's continue this. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Fox's Book of Martyrs. The Inquisitions. Millions of people have been put to death by Roman Catholicism. Millions. Millions and millions. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. And uh, I remember in the notes of the Henry Morris study Bible that he took away, he tried to say that mystery Babylon wasn't Catholicism, that it was actual Babylon. People listen to me. Okay. There are people out there who are ignorant, not knowing better. There are people out there who are willfully ignorant, don't want to know better. And then there are 
coadjutors, Jesuits, those who want to take away the attention from where it ought to be on Roman Catholicism. Okay? Okay, you know that? So when you got people saying that Mystery Babylon isn't Catholicism, it's actually Iraq, Babylon itself. You got a coadjutor, someone who is ignorant, willfully ignorant, or a coadjutor, someone working with the Vatican, and or a Jesuit themselves. Okay? Henry Morris said that it, sh it wasn't Catholicism. Check the notes in his study Bible if you have it. Okay? He said, no. Everyone says it's Catholicism. There's no reason why it should be, called, uh, be considered Catholicism. But actual Babylon itself. No. Mr. Henry Morris was a coadjutor. Absolutely he was. As Ken Helvin, who likes to uh, take away attention from where it ought to be on Rome. Okay? Stephen Anderson says Mystery Babylon's America. <laughs> See, Mystery Babylon is Roman Catholicism. And anyone who says otherwise, like I said, is either ignorant, and with ignorant meaning not knowing better, show grace. Willfully ignorant, don't want to know better, then you, you hit them with the sword of the Spirit. And then Jesuits and coadjutors, Brethren, go at them. Go at them. Don't sit back like a little coward preaching the love gospel. Yes. Go at them. Go at them. Don't get rid of your get rid of them by joining them. How absurd. Let's continue. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, hell. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Seven mountains, the seven hills and stuff like that, which are of Rome. They have a song about it. It's, it's talking about Rome. The original papal chair, the original papal chair is one that was situated on seven mountains. Okay? This is talking about Roman Catholicism, people. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. And one is not yet. To, one is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called, and chosen, and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. On all the waters, peoples, nations, and tongues, and stuff like that. Um, Roman Catholicism is sitting as queen right now. And once we, the Church of the Living God, the body of Christ, be redeemed, caught up, resurrected, you who are left behind are going to be under Rome. Okay. Rome right now controls religion, controls politics, controls money, controls the um, food industry, controls the medical industry. Okay? But see, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. See, we, the Church of the Living God, are here. And we as the Church of the Living God 
we are to do what we can to fight against the mother of harlots. Not join them! Okay? Because they are in control. And once we get out of here, Church of the Living God, they are going to be given full control, full reign, allowed to. Why? For judgment against this world. Verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God should be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, the Vatican, which rule reigneth over the kings of the earth. It's not the Jews. It's not Jerusalem. Okay? Did a video about that a while ago. Okay, be sure to put that in the uh, description box because, see, there are these devil coadjutors who say, it's the Jews, it's the Jews, it's the Masons, it's the Jews. No, it's Catholicism, it's the Jesuits. Revelation chapter 17 is telling you people who the enemy is. It's Roman Catholicism. And you know what? Even the Catholics themselves know that to be the fact. They know that Revelation chapter 17 is talking about them. Jesuits themselves even admit to it. Okay? So, the main power today being allowed to rule and reign thus far for judgment against this world is Roman Catholicism. Satan's church. He's not in complete control yet. Why? Because the church of the God is here. But it's Rome, people. It's not the Masons. The Masons didn't create the Jesuits. Yes, the Masons were around before the Jesuits. Yes, they were. But see, the Jesuits, as infiltrators, have long infiltrated the Masons and have overtaken them and controlled them. Okay? you got to remember that. But it's Jesuit order. It's Roman Catholicism. That is the main power. And... President Kennedy, who was a Catholic, he was not talking about the Masons. He was talking about the Jesuits. Okay? So, with no further ado, I'm going to put my scriptures over here. No further ado, let's watch this. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. And you, I'm going to leave a, a, a link for a documentary on the Jesuit order. Um, America, yes, even though Freemasons. Uh, America was opposed to the Jesuit order. Absolutely. As, absolutely. Absolutely. But see, you've got to also remember, while our founding fathers were Masons, and a lot of the uh, people in America, like Samuel Morse, he spoke out against the Masons. Abraham Lincoln, with his famous, this uh, war would never have been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. Okay? Americans way back when, at our inception, were very well aware and knew about the dangers of the Jesuits, of the Society of Jesus, and secret societies. Okay? Secret oaths he's talking about is the extreme oath of the Jesuits. Okay? See, Kennedy wanted, like I said, to run this country according to that thing, the Constitution. He wanted to print our own money and not be dependent on Rome and not to have this country dictated as Rome from the Pope. Hence, made him very odious. He was a liberal Catholic. Catholics, you pre-Vatican II Catholics and you Catholics in general, uh, liberal Catholics are despised. Almost as despised as Jews and so-called 
Protestants are unto the Catholics. Okay? So let's continue this. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, by imitating its arbitrary restrictions, what does that mean? What is he saying? That he didn't want to run this country like the Vatican. He wasn't talking about Mason's people. He was talking about the Jesuits. This was one of the things that got, among many, this was one of the things that got him killed. And by the way, the Jesuit order killed Kennedy. I'm going to put a link in the description box, um, the uh, thing by uh, Eric John Phelps that talks about the assassination of Kennedy. Okay. There is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. Which is happening today. Censorship and concealment. Hmm. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no Which is why they killed him. No official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. Which is being done today! See, this is what got the... Yes, he was a Democrat. Yes, he was an adulterer and a fornicator. Yes, he was. Yes, he was a Catholic. But everything he has thus far said has been here. Uh, what, what was it you said? I spit on Mother Church. May God spit you out, right? Right? Yeah. This is what Kennedy was doing to Roman Catholicism. That's what uh, Kennedy was doing to the Pope and the Jesuits with this speech. That's exactly what he was doing. Take your part. For well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. That's the Jesuit order he's uh, describing, people. That is the Jesuit order, infiltration and what. For example, you know, you're going to threaten me? At least have the stones, tough guy. At least have the stones to let me know who you are. You're so tough, huh? Yeah, you're a tough guy. Can threaten me without even letting me know who you are? I have, an, uh, I have a good idea who it may be. Okay? Can't say for sure. But you know, you're going you're gonna to threaten me? At least, at least have the stones, tough guy. Let me know who you are. Hmm? Because no matter who you are, I'm letting people know whom you work for. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. 
No expenditure is questioned, this is no exactly rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. For I have complete confidence <laughs> in the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. Amen. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. And you know, see, that that's the thing. I mean, yeah, Kennedy, like I said, he was an adulterer, a fornicator, a Catholic. Yes, he was. But um, he really wanted to do good for this nation. He truly did want to have our nation adhere to that, the Constitution. He really did. And everything he's talking about is a, he's spitting on the Roman Catholic Jesuit order. That's exactly what he's doing. And accountability? <laughs> See, here in America, President Harris and her front man, Smoking Joe, they're accountable to Sosa. They're going to give an account to our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, at the Great White Throne Judgment. But there are many things you can say against this man, John F. Kennedy. Do I think he was a saved man? No, I don't. No, I don't think he was a saved man. I think, actually, he is in hell. But as a president, he did seek to do good things for this nation. And the Jesuits killed him for it. Without debate, without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Sola decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. Yeah. And you see that, oh here, here. Ladies and gentlemen, the very words. Bear with me. Bear with me, brethren. Okay. <laughs> so, now, you check out that video, A Dark Winter, and the links that are in there about the Dark Winter, about um, news censorship and whatnot, <laughs> which our news here, which is Jesuit controlled, is doing today. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, can you see why the Jesuits killed Kennedy? And let's let's get on a, a little bit more of this. Okay, now this is these are some of the uh, this is what some of the stuff I'm going to be sharing with you today. Okay, and also going to be going through some s from uh, this and also this. But let's remember a few things about the Jesuit order. Okay, first and foremost, we're going to start with this from Alberto, okay? Shared this with you on several occasions, but going to be reading a part of this from Alberto about this, okay? As pertaining on to the Masons, okay? Going to be reading this right here, okay? This right here, if you can, okay, if you can pause this and read it. And then I'm going to be reading this entire, let me see, let me see. This entire page. Okay? When I became a priest, I believed I would find the truth and have peace in my heart as I had promised my mother. Instead, I was miserable, life of every Catholic. The higher I went in the Jesuit order, the more corruption I saw within the institution. I was invited to attend a secret black mass by high-ranking Jesuits in a monastery in the northern part of Spain. When I knelt to kiss the ring of a high official, I saw a symbol on that ring that made my blood run cold. It was a Masonic symbol, the square and the compass, the one on top signifies the man. The one on the bottom signifies the woman. The G in the middle stands for gender or gender activity. Okay? It's a sex symbol. Which is on our dollar bill. Masons are Luciferians. They're satanic. Just like Catholics. Okay? Just like the Jesuits. The Jesuits control the Masons. But oh, hold on. It was a Masonic symbol. A thing I hated and had been told to fight against. Interesting. Everything was falling apart. I found out the Black Pope, the Jesuit general, who actually runs the Vatican in Rome behind the scenes, was also a Mason and a member of the Communist Party in Spain. So the head of the Jesuits was also a Mason. Hmm. Very interesting. It's not that he was a Mason first, then a Jesuit. No. The Masons were before the Jesuits, yes. But see, the Jesuits who, who uh, specialized, as we saw Mr. Kennedy speak about them, infiltration. See, Kennedy was, without naming them, Kennedy was specifically fingering the Jesuit order. Okay? He was specifically talking about the Jesuits, not the Masons. The Masons are puppets. Controlled by their puppet master, the Jesuits, i.e. the Vatican. Okay? My head was spinning as I found out the Jesuit general was closely linked to the Illuminati in London. Adam Weissop, a Jesuit. Okay? Adam Weissop, a Jesuit. The Illuminati was created by the Jesuits. <laughs> okay? Brother, that is heavy stuff. I was sick for weeks. Everything I was ordered to fight against all tied together at the top. The pyramid structure, remember? Ignatius Loyola, founder of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, was a, mem was a member of the Alumbros, Alumbrados, which means the Enlightened or the Illuminati. And remember, Adam Weissop, 
created the Illuminati, who was Xisla. Because of my experience in espionage, I was ordered to join the ecumenical forces under Pope John, Pope John the Twenty Third. The Protestants were no longer to be called heretics, but separated brethren. Vatican Council II. The communists were no longer our enemies. Believers, one world church. Here, here. Get, 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 a, lo get a load of it. Where is it? Where is it? See that? Get, get a load of that. Get a load of that. Okay? Pause that and read it. Believers, one world church. Pro Protestants of all denominations. Orthodox churches of all kinds. Muslims. Brahmins. Buddhists, morons, Mormons, occult churches, Eastern religions, TM, Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah's, science of mind, Judaism, non-believers, one world government, communist, all Masonic lodges, Socialists, atheists, labor unions, etc. We have successfully infiltrated all these organizations. Yeah, they have. Thanks to our undercover agents, we have quietly moved into Christian TV and publishing and have been accepted as teachers pastors, and evangelists. We are pushing only love and unity to pull us all together. You sellout. You wicked sellout. Yes, I'm talking about you. You wicked sellout. This is our revival. Our masterpiece is the third force, which is the charismatic movement. This is the bridge to Rome. Those Protestants have accepted us with open arms. Yeah, because you're preaching love to everybody. The uh, was this? The Vatican Moscow Washington Alliance by a Avro Manhattan, 1982. Fortunately, trying to get something from Avro Manhattan, oh, cost a lot of money. The first Protestant groups they fully, the first Protestant groups they moved on were the Seventh Day Adventists and full gospel businessmen, and we're going to be reading something uh, from a Seventh Day Adventist. You know, like, uh, what's that guy? Uh, Doug Batchelor, I believe his name is, a Seventh-day Adventist. Talks about the Jesuits, against the Jesuits. Oh, uh, you all know Walter Reef, Bill Hughes, Seventh-day Adventist. But their information against the Jesuits is something else, but yet the Jesuits have infiltrated them. Hmm, go figure. Then into the Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, etc., until they were all inf infiltrated, including the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. All the seminaries, universities, and colleges were next. The Jesuit-directed Catholic Youth Action, Legion of Mary, and Knights of Columbus, who pulled it off. Now, these groups are silent about Rome, or claim that Rome, the Roman system is a Christian church. They are winning through compromise. Almost all Protestant pastors are afraid to speak out against Rome. Aren't you? If they did, those planted in their churches would attack them on demand. Oh, wow, really? So you speak out against Rome, uh... Brethren will come up, will finally, will finally make themselves known as coadjutors and find some of the most ridiculous things to attack you on. Really? <laughs> yeah. Pay attention to this stuff, people. 
This is the great apostasy, the great falling away the Bible speaks of before the Lord Jesus returns. Yeah, people who claim they were of the church of the living God, but never were. Yeah. Yeah. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed to some perdition. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Now, falling away um, is signified in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 on verse 20, about how they went out from us, but they were not of us, but they went out from us that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Because if they were of, if they were of us, they would have continued with us. I just Brad, Brad I said, beg your pardon, but that's the falling away. Okay? You with me so far? Now, here's another part uh, from Alberto Rivera. I'm going to read this page here in its entirety. Okay? Oh, sorry. Here, I'm working. I'm working on it, brother. Okay? The religious machine of today is very, very old. It started right after Noah's flood. Satan used two key people, Nimrod and his wife Semiramis, the queen of heaven, the scriptures talk about, to originate this worldwide occult religion in the city of Babylon. After Nimrod's death, Semiramis, and this is all documented in the two Babylons. After Nimrod's death, Semiramis had a son, Tammuz, and claimed he was Nimrod reincarnated. reincarnated. This Nimrod's Nimrod, Tammuz, married his mother. And after his death, Semiramis claimed he became that, he claimed he had become the sun god, Baal. Some of the names given him were Sol, S-O-L, Ashur, Atis, Adonis, Horus. Oh, like the eye of Horus? Sun god? Hmm. And that eagle, like you see in the thumbnail, that's Ra, the sun god. That's on our dollar bill. And the mason sign, the seal of the masons, the false, erroneous flag of Israel today. The uh, flag of the tribe of Judah is the true flag of Israel. Okay? That's the true flag. But the mason sign on our dollar bill, yeah. The system made her into a goddess. Semiramis also ended up with many names throughout the centuries, like Isis in Egypt, Venus, and the Queen of Heaven, which is given to us in the scriptures. Just like the religious system of today, it was likened to politics worldwide. Here is the link today. It is found in the obelisk, which is a four-sided pillar facing the four corners of the earth. You flat earthers, don't go off on that. Okay? Leave that alone. At its peak is a pyramid. It represents a combination of both religious and political power worldwide. It appears in Egypt, in the U.S. Washington Monument, and in the Vatican. To the Jesuits, Masons and the Illuminati. It secretly stands for the One World Government. The obelisk is a cult, obviously. It represents the sun god, Baal. It also represents life through sex. It is a phallic symbol, male organ. The Masons, the male, the female, the G. It's a sex symbol. Look, you're Jewish. Your flag, the seal of Solomon, that's a sex symbol. Your true flag is the uh, Lion of Judah. Okay? The flag with the tribe of the Lion of Judah on that, that is your true flag. Okay? You have a perverted symbol 
for your flag. Okay? Please understand that. Dr. Rivera, now, Dr. Rivera explained that when he was under the extreme oath of the Jesuits, he was told that a secret sign was to be given to the Jesuits worldwide when the ecumenical movement had successfully wiped out Protestantism. In preparation for the signing of a concordat between the Vatican and the U.S., the sign was to be when a president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, took his oath of office facing an obelisk. For the first time in U.S. history, the swearing-in ceremonies were moved to the west front of the Capitol, and President Reagan faced the Washington Monument. This happened January 20th, 1981. Was the president aware of this? We do not know. Let's, okay. Okay, now then he says that's something else. But the, the, 19, the sign in 1981 of Reagan going there, that was onto the uh, Jesuits. Like it said, everything was infiltrated. All churches. All denominations. And that long includes the Masons, by the way. Now, we're going gonna to look at this on the last page of this. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Let me see. Okay. There we go. There we go. Big. I'm working on it, brother. Okay? And so, for the last 1600 years, Satan has almost destroyed everybody through the Roman Catholic institution. Millions of Catholics and others died in World Wars I and II. For what? Just to give more power to the Vatican. They play games. And millions die for it. The poor Nazis have been betrayed. This group growing in the U.S. is nothing more than Catholic action led by Jesuits. Note, as incredible as it seems, some Jews who converted to Catholicism have actually joined the American Nazi Party. Oh, what's that guy's name? Soros? Yeah. The poor Orthodox churchgoers slaughtered by the Crusaders and the Pope's killer squads, the Eustachi, have now bowed to the new communist Pope and are in his camp. They too have been betrayed. Israel has also been betrayed. They are now making friends with their deadliest enemy, Roman Catholicism, the Vatican who slaughtered them in the past and will almost completely annihilate them before the Lord returns the time of Jacob's trouble. The KKK, the poor Ku Klux Klaners, have been betrayed, not realizing that they have played into the hands of the Jesuits. And this is one of the minor children of the whore. The poor Masons have been betrayed. They didn't even know Pope Pius XII was a good mason. They will never believe they too are children of the whore and are controlled at the top by the black pope. Masons are controlled by the black pope. Sosa. Okay? Thanks to their leaders, the poor Protestants now love the pope. Rick Warren, that scum, um, Billy Graham, yeah. And many more are in fellowship with the horror of Revelation 17. The Bible says, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh? No wonder they don't speak out against the Vatican. The poor communists have been betrayed. They are simply a branch of the Roman Catholic institution, the bully for the Vatican. And communism is what they want to institute right now through the United Nations. Um, what is it? The Agenda 21 
um, eminent domain and sustainable development, that kind of stuff. They are the muscle looking for a utopia on earth. And remember, the book Utopia, where the Jesuits created communism. And then they attributed the creation of communism, which was based on their work uh, in the Reductiones in Paraguay. The book Utopia talks about it, okay? Um, they attribute that onto Marx and Engel. Just like Stamphill, Father Joseph Stamphill, wrote Mein Kampf and attributed it to the guy Hitler. Okay? They are the muscle looking for a utopia on earth, but they'll be destroyed by Christ when they attack Israel on orders from the Pope. And worst of all, the precious Roman Catholics have been betrayed by a slick presentation of Baal worship dressed up to look like Christianity. Their popes are only men. Their priests and nuns are only people. And the Vatican is only a temple of Satan. Taking millions into hell by giving them a false gospel, a false Christ, and another spirit. May God help them to have strength to come out of her. And it quotes Galatians. Galatians 1. In the authorized version of the scriptures. Galatians chapter 1. Verses 8 and 9. Come on. There we go. Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If I can get there, we go. But though we, Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Oh, the Jesus of Christianity today, the easy believism Jesus, the love gospel, another gospel, another Christ. Not too long ago, great men of God believed the Pope was an antichrist. They were Wycliffe, Luther, Calvin, Tyndale, Knox, Sir Isaac Newton, Fox, Wesley, Finley, Moody, Spurgeon. Could they be right? Let's see what the popes said about themselves. We declare, assert, define, and pronounce to be subject to the Roman pontiff. To be subject to the Roman pontiff is to every human creature altogether necessary for salvation. Pope Boniface, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, five, six, seven, eight. Ah, Pope Boniface the eighth. I am all in all and above all, so that God Himself and I, the Vicar of God, have but one consist consistent story, consist story, and I am able to do almost all that God can do. What therefore can you what therefore can you make of me but God, Pope Nicholas? We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty, Pope Leo the Thirteenth. There you have it. The popes admitted they were antichrists. Now, who will you serve? You must choose Christ or the Vatican. We got one, we got one. Oh, we ain't done yet. <laughs> we ain't done yet, boy. We ain't done yet, boy. Okay? Here. Going to read where my finger is now. This is a thumbnail on one of the other videos that I have, but I'm going to read this thing right here. Okay? Look at that. Okay? Look at that. Okay? Can you see that? Sorry if I keep moving. Okay? There. There we go. Can you see that? Okay. His color is black, 
the color of the Jesuit order, which seeks to dominate the world economy for the Antichrist, some tradition, through the following front organizations. Number one starts with the Jesuits. The Illuminati. You saw it. The Club of Rome. Council of Foreign Relations. The Opus Dei. International Bankers. The Masons. Masons aren't even up in the upper echelon. The Mafia. Criminal Arm of the Vatican. New Age Movement. The Catholic Church is the biggest financial power, wealth accumulator, and property owner in existence. She is a greater possessor of material riches than any other single institution, corporation, bank, giant trust, government, or state of the whole globe. Yeah. The Pope, as the visible ruler of this immense assessment of wealth, is consequently the richest individual in the, the 20th century. No one can realistically assess how much he is worth in terms of billions of dollars. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. You can't. You can't. Why is that? Because they control everything. They control all the money. And you got to remember, once the church of the living God is redeemed, caught up, resurrected, taken out of here, that man of sin, the son of perdition, inaccurately, inaccurately referred to as the Antichrist. Okay, His goal is, midway through that time of Jacob's trouble, to get everybody to take a mark in their right hand or in their forehead that no man might buy or sell, uh, sell save those who had the mark of the beast. Okay? That's the ultimate goal. To control all the, con the economies. Okay? Now, going to be reading uh, some quotes. This, uh, this is in the video called The um, Jesuit Secrets Revealed. Okay, that's uh, what this is from. Uh, we're going to be reading, uh, and I'm going to put this in the description box as well, uh, just what secrets revealed. This is the basic transcript of that whole video. Okay? Uh, so, and <laughs> this, this website that you get this from, it's a Hebrew, it's apparently a Hebrew Roots website too. But Samuel Morse. Here's a quote from Samuel Morse. I'll put the video of this in the description box for you, okay? The Jesuits, the Society of Men, after exerting their tyranny for upwards of 200 years, at length becomes so formidable to the world, threatening the entire threatening the entire subversion of all social order, that even the Pope, whose devoted subject they are, subjects they are, and must be, by the vow of their society, <laughs> was compelled to dissolve them. They had not been suppressed, however, for fifty years before the waning influence of popery and despotism required their useful labors to resist the light of democratic liberty, and the Pope, Pius the five, six, seventh, simultaneously with the formation of the Holy Alliance, revived the order of the Jesuits in all their power, from their vow of unqualified submission to the sovereign Pope Pontiff, they have been appropriately called the Pope's bodyguard. And do Americans need to be told what Jesuits are? But yeah, apparently they do. They are a secret society, a sort of Masonic order, with super added features of revolting odiousness and a thousand times more dangerous. Yeah, the Jesuits control the Masons. Okay? They are not merely priests of one religious creed. They are merchants. Pay attention to this. 
They are merchants and lawyers and editors and men of any profession. Having no outward bad badge in this country by which to be recognized, they are about in all your society. They are merchants and lawyers and editors and men of any profession. See again, coadjutors want to tell you that Jesuits don't mess with the little people. No, it's it's the pyramid thing. Okay, it starts from the bottom. And all that's from the bottom, the small people, it all drifts up, funnels into one head that the head may be enriched. The orders come down from the one head and feed all down the pyramid. Okay? Well, why do you think the pyramid thing is so big in the occult? Okay? And this is going to be important to remember what we're looking at here from Samuel Morris and a bit from their secret oath. Uh, about the Masons, okay? They can assume any character. Fragile, weak people. Loving, smiling people. Bold people who make an idol out of a man. They can assume any character. That of angels of light or ministers of darkness to accomplish their one great end, the service upon which they are sent, whatever that service may be. Whether it's to infiltrate, to get information, to destroy, kill, whatever it is. They are all educated men. Yes, they are. Prepared and sworn to start at any moment and in any direction. And for any service commanded by the general of their order, bound to no family, community, or country, by the ordinary ties which men which bind men, and sold for life to the cause of the Roman pontiff. We're going to be reading about the Titanic, by the way. Keep this in mind when we get to that. And who are these agents? They are, for the most part, Jesuits. An ecclesiastical order proverbial through the world for her cunning, duplicity, and total want of moral principle. An order so skilled in all the arts of deception that even in Catholic countries, in Italy itself, it became intolerable and the people required its suppression. Was there another thing? Yes. There's a quote by Fedor Dostoevsky, or whatever his name is, the Russian novelist. The Jesuits are simply the Roman army for the earthly sovereignty of the world in the future. With the pontiff of Rome for emperor to be the son of perdition, that their, that's their ideal. It's simple lust of power, of filthy earthly gain, of domination, something like a universal serfdom with them as masters. That's all they stand for. They don't even believe in God, perhaps. And that I disagree with. They believe in God. Who is their God? Lucifer. Satan. That man of sin, son of perdition. Now, I'm going to read to you a little of the Jesuit or uh, extreme oath. Oh, you hate this, don't you? Okay, here. Can you see that? Okay. And to right here. Here, I'm going to read up to right here, okay? Up to right here, where my finger is, okay? Now, on this channel, there's a video where we go through the entire uh, 
uh, oath. On my secondary channel, my backup channel, Least of All Fellowship, there is a video that has somebody talking about the entirety of the, uh, the oath itself. Uh, I'll put one of them in the description box for you. If not, you can find it on the channel here. But, when a Jesuit of the minor rank is to be elevated to command, he is conducted into the chapel of the covenant of the order, where there, where there are only three others present, the principal or superior standing in front of the altar. On either side stands a monk, one of whom holds a banner of yellow and white, which are the papal colors, and the other a black banner with a dagger and red cross above a skull and crossbones with the words I-N-R-I, -I. and below them the words Istum Nakar Regis Impious, the meaning of which is, it is just to exterminate or annihilate impious or heretical kings, governments, or rulers. Upon the floor is a red cross at which the postulant or candidate kneels. The superior hands him a small black crucifix, which he takes in his left hand and presses to his heart. And the superior at the same time presents to him a dagger, which he grasps by the blade and holds the point against his heart, the superior still holding it by the hilt, and thus addresses the postulant. And a lot of this, um, the link for this, the actual link for this is on my channel here in the About section. Uh, BibleBelievers.org. Okay, you press that link. It still works. It will take you to this. You can see this for yourself. Okay. Uh, also, too, you heard of the Mafia Omerta, derived from a version of the Extreme Oath. Okay. Superior. Okay. Now keep this in mind. Remember. Beg your pardon, brother. Remember. Infiltrate. Remember what we listened to by Kennedy? That's what Jesuits do. They are infiltrators. They are agents. Not everyone is a Catholic or a openly working for the Vatican, but they are they um, openly working for the Vatican. Okay, but they are in disguise. They take any form. They take any shape. Okay, they can be. Weak little people, strong, mighty people, loving, smiley people, a loving husband and wife, all working for the Vatican. Okay? My son, heretofore you have been taught to act a dissembler among Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your own brethren. To believe no man, to trust no man. See, they don't trust anybody. They want to make us, the Church of the Living God, have no trust for even ourselves. Amongst ourselves as one body. See, that's what people who are working for the Vatican who come in and want to cause division. Because they themselves who are working for the Vatican don't trust anybody. And they want to bring that kind of, you know, they uh, uh, false brethren crept in unawares to spy out our liberty. They want to hinder us from having trust in one another as a church of the living God, one body. Among the reformers, to be a reformer. Among the Huguenots, to be a Huguenot. Among the Calvinists, to be a Calvinist. Among other Protestants, generally to be a Protestant. And obtaining their confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits and to denounce with all the vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope, and even to descend so low as to become a Jew among Jews. That's what the Catholics, Jesuits, think of the Jewish people. That you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. You have been taught to insidiously Plant the seeds of jealousy. This is what they do. This is what these coadjutors do. That's what these devils, hi Smiley, on YouTube do. Okay? That's what these devils do. Okay? Catholics. You're, you're all Catholics. You're either working for the Jesuits or you are Jesuits. 
if you're a Mason, you're working for the Jesuits. Okay? It doesn't matter. You're, you're all Catholics. All of you. All you infiltrators, scum. You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces, states that were at peace. Yeah, we've experienced that. Uh, people working for the Vatican come in all peacefully, smiling, loving, and then they come up with ridiculous accusations and drop bombs to uh, amongst those who were at peace. Yeah. And incite them to deeds of blood involving them in war with each other. See, that's what they want to do. They want to get the body of Christ, the church of the living God, to fight against each other, okay? And to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences and enjoying the blessings of peace. To take sides with the combatants and to act secretly with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that which with which you might be connected, only that the church might be the gainer in the end, in the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that the end justifies the means. I've seen this all over. There are people who pretend to be fighting against each other, a young Canadian boy and a fine English gentleman, pretending to fight with one another. They're working on the same side, okay? They're working on the same side. The end justifies the means. Okay? The, these agents come uh, uh, come about. Uh, it's like, why are you always talking about Jesuits? Why this and why that? And sending other people about, oh, uh, God's love is unconditional. It, they're all working together. See, the Hegelian dialect. Thesis. Antithesis. Synthesis. Okay? They're working both sides. Because why? The end justifies the means, people. You have been taught your duty as a spy to gather all st statistics, facts, and information in your power from every source to ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of Protestants and heretics of every class and character. And my wife and I have experienced this firsthand. We experienced coadjutors who work for the Vatican who do this exact thing. We've experienced it. As well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, among the schools and universities, in parliaments and legislatures, and the judiciaries and councils of state, and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as coadjutor, confessor and priest, but you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner as directed by your superiors. Yeah, being led around like a dog upon a leash. Why? Why, boy? Why? Is the reward from them that great for you? I hope so, because that's the best you're going to get in this life unless you repent. Come to our Lord broken and contrite, and in fear of Him, call upon His name. For none can command here who have not consecrated their labors with the blood of the heretic. For without the shedding of blood, no man can be saved. <laughs> See, it's a meritorious act on the Jesuits when they kill people. You know, in Utah where morons are, they still have death and execution by firing range because of this very thing. Masons are in league with the Jesuits too, by the way, if you haven't figured that one out. Let's continue. Therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me, 
See, when these people, these coercitors, these devils, they, they don't love you. They're not telling you the truth. You know, Smiley up in Canada there with his just believe doctrine, okay? <laughs> Preaching the love gospel, those of you in Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't love you. They're not telling you the truth. They're preaching to you another Jesus, another gospel. They're working for the Vatican. One, probably most definitely a Jesuit himself. Some, out of fear. Fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth in the trust of the Lord shall be made safe. Mary Palmer Hall. A Mason of Masons. What does he have to say about the Masons? Now, we've, I've showed you the evidence. The Masonic Lodges, the Masons, are controlled by the Jesuit order. Okay? There was a time when the Masons and Jesuits fought. Yes, there was. But at, le at, at the very least, by the time of Alberto Rivera, at the very least, even beforehand, even beforehand, I say in the beginning 1800s at the least, at the least, at the least. Well, that doesn't really hold true because Weissop was a Jesuit and he was also a Freemason, so, <laughs> so it goes further back, way further back to how long the Masons have been controlled by the Jesuit order. Okay? But we're going to learn a little thing about now. I freely admit to you that uh, the Freemasons are not, you know, not my big thing. I, I, you know, the Lord has taught me a lot about the Jesuits and how to spot them and to preach against them, no matter how they threaten me. But this is the book. And look at that. George Washington, our first president, who was a Freemason. There are some out there who like to say that he wasn't. Eh, I beg to differ, Mr. Phelps. But see, here's the book. Okay. If you can get it, go ahead and get it. Uh, this is a... Yeah. But when you see the Masonic symbol, we need to remember something. Now, we're not going to read all of this. Uh, talks a lot about the five senses here in this part, uh, uh, in this book. Five senses, which is something that Ignatius de Loyola and his spiritual exercise focuses on. Mm-hmm. Any coincidence? I think perhaps, maybe no. But I'm going to be reading this highlighted section, which begins right here. See that highlighted spot right there? And right here. That's why I'm going to be reading you. Keep this in mind about these Freemasons. He has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. And before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy. No marvel, Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light. In another video, maybe today we'll see how much time I got left today, but in another video, I'm going to address that a little bit more thoroughly, okay? So, the God of the Freemasons is Lucifer. The God of Catholicism is Lucifer. Mm -hmm. Right here, from top to bottom of the yellow, this is what I'm going to be reading you, okay? From top to bottom, from right there to where you see that yellow bracket, that's what I'm going to be reading you. There we go. There we go. Sorry, brother, I'm working on it. Okay? This is what I'm going to be reading you. Now, we, we heard about the Jesuits, how they're to uh, go to, to be, take any form and shape. It can be anything, any religion. The true Mason is not creed bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that a Mason, that as a Mason, 
His religion must be universal. Catholicos. His religion must be universal. Catholic means universal. Hello, bloop. Hello, people. Christ, Buddha, or Mohammed. The name means little. For he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. Sounds kind of ecumenical, doesn't it? And this is from, this is a Mason of the Masons. Manly Palmer Hall. This is, this is, this is, uh, this is an authority on such. He worships at every shrine. Bows before every altar like a Jesuit. Whether in temple, mosque, or cathedral. Realizing with his truer understanding the oneness of all spiritual truth. Vatican II. There are many paths to God. Pay, pay attention to this. You're going to like this. Okay? <laughs> big, big part. Big part. Got a lot of information we're going through. All true Masons know that they only are heathen who, having great ideals, yeah, given to them by Satan, do not live up to them. They know that all religions are but one story. Ever heard that one, huh? Story told in divers ways for peoples whose ideals differ, but whose great purpose is in harmony with Masonic ideals. North, east, south, and west stretch the diversities of human thought. And while, and this guy ought to know all about human, okay? And while the ideals of man apparently differ, when all is said and the crystallization of form with its false, a form with its false concepts is swept away, one basic truth remains. All existing things are temple builders. Work salvation. Laboring for a single end. <laughs> Verbatim. No true Mason can be narrow. For his lodge is the divine expression of all broadness. Oh, we're going to read that. Don't worry about it. There is no place for little minds in great work. You know where we're going? For those of you who do not know, Matthew chapter 7, Mason, controlled by the Jesuit order. Oh, oh Matthew chapter 7, verses 13. Hmm. On the verse uh, 23. Why not? Enter ye in at uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 on to verse 23. A mason must be broad, can't be narrow. The masons are controlled by the Jesuit order. The masons don't run anything. The, the Jews are not, it's not a Jew world order as I've heard. Blasphemy. No, why is that blasphemy? Because Jesus Christ was a Jew. He followed the law. He kept it perfectly. Okay? He came on to his own who were Hebrews. I already ex explained this in a video before. But, okay? So, broad is the way that leads to life? Really? Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many... Many, <laughs> Jesuits, many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. 
but inwardly they are raving wolves. I would rather, I, I am more willing to um, give the time of day to someone who is outwardly offensive to only find out that it's actually harboring a soft heart. Most of the fake people that we have encountered and have, uh, uh, have attacked me personally turn out to be very nice and sweet on the outside, but inside are full of dead, dead men's bones. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Temple builders, huh? Temple builders. Church buildings. The Catholic, it's a, so what is it, a seven step thing to salvation and there's no assurance of salvation because to have assurance of salvation, which the scriptures teach us, that is the sin of what? Catholic? The sin of presumption. Now, let's, uh, the Illuminati. The Illuminati. The Illuminati was founded by Adam Weissa. Okay? And I opened it right up to the Illuminati. could read this to you, but uh, the uh, documentary that I'll be putting in the description box will take care of this. Well, all right. Well, going to read, going to read actually quite a bit here. Okay. Esoteric, esoteric. Esoteric and esoteric. One doctrine for those, the uh, average people, and one for the initiated, those in the know. Remember that. Going to be reading from where my finger is all the way down to where my finger is on the opposite page. Okay? So, let me see. Well, I'm trying my best to get this for you. Okay? Can you see that? Okay, here, here, here. Here's what we'll do. From here, can you, see, you can see that, can't you, brother? Yeah? To right here. You can see that, right? Okay. It's not like I have $1,299 uh, $1 to spend on a camera from up above or anything. The idea of Illuminism as they are found in the pagan mysteries of antiquity, where all were old when Weisop was born, and it is unlikely that the, that these long cherished convictions perished with the with his Bavarian experiment. The work that was unfinished in 1785 remains unfinished in 1950. Esoteric orders will not become extinct until the purpose which brought them into being has been fulfilled. One world government, setting up that man of sin, the son of perdition. Organizations may perish, but the great school is indestructible. Of passing interest is the crusade of the Reverend Jedediah Morse of Charleston, South Carolina, against the threat of an illuminist invasion of the United States. Capitalizing on the proclamation issued by President John Adams, March 23, 1798, referring to the, hazard, hazard, to the hazardous and afflictive position in which the country had been placed, the Reverend Morris preached with great fervor 
against the atheistic French state and its determination to corrupt the morals of the Western Hemisphere. A minor tempest followed, both sides of the issue resolute but uninformed. The Illuminati were presented as a huge association of godless persons, amen, determined to destroy the church and state. Yes, the Illuminati, founded by Weissop, Weissop, Weissop a Jesuit. The Illuminati, a front group for the Jesuits, okay? Our founding fathers, my American countrymen, were either Masons and in the Illuminati. Doesn't that give you great hope as American, huh? Reverend Morse depended largely upon certain memories of Jacobinism invented and compiled by Abby Burrell and the attacks on Freemasons, the Illuminati, and the reading societies by Dr. John Robinson. Rob, Robinson. This learned doctor should have limited his interests to his chosen fields of hydrodynamics, astronomy, electricity, and magnetism. His readings in Freemasonry seem to have undermined his critical facilities, for he decided that an association had been formed for the express purpose of corrupting all the religious establishments and existing governments of Europe. This group was the Illuminati, which had apparently been disbanded, but actually had extended its activities throughout the whole world. Remember, the Illuminati was created by Adam Weissop, a Jesuit. The Illuminati is a Jesuit organization, people. Wake up. See, those of you truthers talk about Masons, the Illuminati, Zionism. You need to go to the head. Catholicism, Rome, the Jesuit order. Okay? Yes, the Masons are real. Yes, they are in control of some things. Yes, the Illuminati, yes. But who controls them? The head of the pyramid. The Jesuits. Okay? In the ensuing flurry, a number of excited clergymen quoted each other and sometimes themselves to provoke the horrible hazards of the hour. George Washington was cited, Mr. Noah Webster orated, and politicians warned their const constituents that opposing candidates were probably Illuminists in disguise, Jesuits. Of course, Thomas Paine, who authored Common Sense, Satanic, and Thomas Jefferson received appropriate criticism and it was even suggested that the American Society of United Irishmen was subversive. Masonic, Masonic lodges were suspected of deep and dark doings, <laughs> in spite of the fact that most of the patriots of the revolutionary period, including General Warren, who fell at Bunker Hill, and George Washington, were Freemasons of standing and reputation. Let's read a little bit more. Actually, the Illuminist bubble was little better than a clerical hysteria, and there is no proof that there was any substance beneath the extravagant reports just gave you proof. <laughs> you gotta remember, you gotta remember who Mr. Manley Palmer was. And Mr. Pan, uh, Mr. Manley Palmer Hall is in hell because he was a Mason, a Mason of the highest order, Mason of the Masons. He's in hell. If European secret societies of the period exercised an influence in the young American Republic, such influence certainly was not malevolent. <laughs> The results, if any, are found in the separation of the state and church. 
a clear-cut policy in American government. George Washington stated firmly that he did not believe that doctrines of the Illuminati or principles of Jacobinism had spread in the United States. At the same time, he defended the integrity of the Masonic lodges of his country. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. But at the same time, you got to remember, uh, you got to remember, the Freemasons were controlled by the Jesuits. And here's a, here's a fact that some of those of our founding fathers who were Freemasons probably did not know that their own... We, we saw it. I showed you the proof in, a, in well, one of the Alberto comic books that not even the Masons, uh, the regular Masons, knew of the Jesuit infiltration and Jesuit control. See? They were ignorant. But see, one of the things that John F. Kennedy did that got him killed was one of the many things uh, besides that speech. He wanted to take away the Federal Reserve System, the, Red, the Federal Reserve, which is the Bank of the Pope, the Bank of the Jesuits. Okay? Now, that is significant. Why? Okay? First, I'm going to read to you a bit from this book. This guy I've looked into, eh, a lot of you make America great people and you truthers probably know who this guy is. I've looked into him. Uh, sounds, he, he says some good things. But uh, America is not coming back, people. Trump is going to be, the Jesuits are going to use Trump as they use Napoleon. You watch, you watch, okay? America is done for. The only hope that you have as an American is to get saved. There'll be a link in the description box that you and I can reason together. Okay? But I'm going to read a little bit of this to you. Um, a sister, a dearly, dearly beloved sister, turned me on to this. And I'm going to be reading several pages to you of this. This will not take long. Okay? All right. Pause that and read it if you can. Let me see. Can you? Oh, oh, wow! Shouldn't step up that quick. But okay. Pause that and read it. Can you see that? Okay. Pause that and read it if you can. Pause that and read it if you can. Pause that and read it if you can. And that will be it for that. Okay? Like I said, this will not take that long. Okay? This is this this is a pretty good book. Um, one of three that I got uh, talking about these devils, the United Nations. Uh, a video in the future on the United Nations will be coming when I don't know. Eminent domain. Our problem as a nation is an electorate, electorate given to fraud and schemes. Because no provision was written into the United States Constitution regulating borrowing or spending by the Congress of these United States. There exists and has for years a problem regulating the nation, national debt beginning in 1913 when the Federal Reserve was instituted. The problem is defic defect spending, deficit, excuse me, deficit spending. Borrowing and paying interest on debt on the debt with taxpayer dollars out of the Federal Treasury. This is what George Washington warned America at its founding and to keep America free from its burden as if foreign armies had absconded with government property without ever firing a shot. Like the Jesuits have. Like China is doing right now through Bill Gates. In our history, the problem has grown to become an unaccountable deficit 
borrowing and spending, making it impossible for the federal government to police itself without shutting it down. Our history also shows that since 1913, America has failed to put in place safeguards to prevent this unaccountable cycle to come to an end. We the people demand that this government stop its endless cycle for the good of our country, our children, and generations to come. Sounds great! It sure does, doesn't it? But see, you have to understand, America is controlled by the Jesuits. Kamala Harris is a Jesuit. Her front man, Smoking Joe, Catholic, working for the Jesuits. All the upper echelons here in America are controlled by the Jesuit order. America isn't coming back. This is good! Yes! But America is not coming back. We as Americans, we need to concentrate on the individual. The spirit, soul, and body. The person. Because as a nation... As a nation... There's no way. And remember... Because of the trading uh, of the with the Enemy Act by what was that Roosevelt, we are under executive power. The Constitution can be circumvented because we are under a papal system, a papal interdict. Okay, we are under a papal system of government with Kamala Harris as the head. Never mind, Smoking Joe. Okay, never mind. He's the front man, Kamala Harris. You know, Miss Smiley. Looks like a capo demon. I'm telling you what. The ruling bank families in the Federal Reserve Central Bank know exactly the burden that they have created by design upon the American people and their children. People say, well, it's, they're talking about the Rothschilds, which are Jewish, yes. Remember, there are some stupid Jews out there who have sold themselves over to the Vatican and betrayed their own people. Like uh, the uh, Soros, who uh, basically created Black Lives Matter, funded it, okay? A Mason, a traitor to his people. He joined the Nazis. Yeah. They know the bigger the debt on the nation, the greater their profits from the deficit. They're not about to reduce it because they know they don't have to. But that does not release them from the liability of their fraud on the nation. Specifically, Executive Order 11110, signed June 4th, 1963, by then President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, transferring control of America's monetary system to the United States Treasury. Aha! Right there. This is why we are reading this. Why this ties into why we looked at Kennedy's things uh, thing at the beginning. He wanted to take the control of America out of the hand of the Vatican, in accordance with that, the Constitution, and put it back into the hands of the people. He was an adulterer, a fornicator, and a Catholic. But he had the interest of this nation of the people in mind. He really did. And because he did this, Executive Order 11110, one of the many reasons why the Catholics, the Jesuits, killed him. We can see that in June 1963, America borrowed $305,805,59 uh, an incredible amount of money, backed by gold and silver in 1963. Today, the debt has grown and keeps growing to, an accept, to unacceptable limits, all to make the bankers more money on interest charged on their debt, the fictitious debt thing that we got going on here in, in America. Credit. See, way back when, our American dollar was backed by gold and silver. Guess what, people? There ain't no gold and silver in Fort Knox. There isn't. There are some out there that like to argue that um, 
the American gold and silver at its foundation was the treasure of the Templars. They even made a movie about that. Uh, there's no evidence, historical evidence to back that up. But at one time, the American dollar was backed by gold and silver. That's not the case anymore. Rome has taken our gold and silver. Here's the evidence. From 1963 to 1999, the national debt climbed from $305 billions to over $5 trillions in a matter of 36 years. Now it's approaching $21 trillion, with trillions in unfunded mandates stuck to the states. The cartel has made its business to loan the federal government any amount of fiat currency it requires as long as it pays the interest on the debt. The cartel. This guy doesn't link the Jesuits. Why? Probably he's a mason. They have also made it their business to cause harm to citizens by causing the government to collect taxes to pay them. The debt, however, cannot be paid, but it can be forgiven. How? Because it's backed by nothing. You see, you see this? This is the American dollar. Okay? This is not backed by anything. This is, I mean, this is backed by imaginary credit. It used to be that the dollar was backed by gold and silver. Rome has stolen our gold and silver. There ain't no gold in Fort Knox, people. Wake up. Okay? It was backed by gold and silver. This is useless. The only thing that makes this valid is the imaginary credit given to this nation by the Jesuit Bank, the Federal Reserve. Now, as you see in the thumbnail, okay, see this? Now, the meaning of that, uh, some have said what it means, uh, that um, order out of chaos or order without God, but see this? The pyramid structure, remember the pyramid structure, Masonic, okay? You know, it starts at the top of the Jesuits and goes down. The prophets go up to the head of the temple, the pyramid, okay? See that? That's the Eye of Horus. See that? And you'll see this on the thumbnail. You see that? The eagle there? Look at that. That's the symbol of Ra, okay? That is the symbol of Ra on our American currency. And you see this thing right here? You see this? See that? Yeah, let me fit me a dude. See that little star thing there? Look at it. Look at that. You connect the dots. That's the seal of the Masons, which is a sex symbol. As a English devil himself, and I give him credit for this, an English devil himself said, I would never own a $1 bill. That's our currency, people, here in America. That's our currency. Given to us by Rome. The same people who formed the cartel sold the country that the, told, sold the, country that the banks would take care of of the financial needs of the nation so long as the nation paid them interest on the debt. I can't prove this to you, but the interest, the debt, the taxes that we are paying here in America, they're going to Rome because the Federal Reserve is the one printing our currency. The Federal Reserve is the Jesuit bank. The Federal Reserve System is neither federal nor reserve, 
of currency nor a system. It is, an, uh, it is in effect a banker's cartel who lends fiat currency with no value for interest payments to the members of the cartel every month administered by the IRS and Treasury. Fiat, worthless. Our, our dollar is worth nothing because it's backed by woo -woo -woo, imagination. And people kill each other over that. And unfortunately, we need that to pay our bills. This relationship was designed by the scientists of the Federal Reserve System. Hey, Mr. Ball, why don't you just say the Jesuits? You afraid, are you, huh? And this guy, this Ball guy here, this guy, he ran for president, apparently. But yet, like virtually all politicians, not saying anything about the Jesuits. Hmm, go figure that one out. They knew exactly what they should do to make the system work for the for work for them opposite the American taxpayer. In effect, it is a corrupt institution that funds the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. There is absolutely no evidence that Executive Order 11110, signed June 4, 1963, has been rescinded or the wording that nullified it despite other presidents' issues. We are left that since, we are left that since every president since Lyndon Johnson, who brought in 501c3, has ignored it, that perhaps fearful that if they were to follow its directive, they too might be killed, like President Kennedy was. But who killed them, Mr. Ball? The cartel? The Jesuits. Both Lincoln and Kevin Kennedy believed the nation should issue and regulate its own currency. For one of the many reasons also why Lincoln was killed. Not a foreign bank masquerading around as a federal entity, but a private banking cartel. The nation had seen this before during the presidency of Andrew Jackson, 1829 to 1837. The Bank of the United States was shut down by Jackson, but an attempt was made on his life. Jackson, founder of the Democratic Party, surmised as warned by George Washington that the currency of the nation was sovereign to the United States Treasury and should stay in its control both in the manufacturing and minting of printed and coin currency. The, infiltra the, infil the inflation non-backed currency wars on the dollar devaluating the dollar's worth in terms of purchasing power and payment of debt release. Diluting the economy with unbacked greenbacks is a recipe for more inflation and higher prices. The Weimar Republic in Germany, who went to fiat paper currency. Uh, Alberto Rivera talks about that. How people would bring in um, uh, wheelbarrows full of paper money, but it wasn't enough to buy a loaf of bread. Why? Because the paper money is backed by nothing. Guess what, people? America, my fellow Americans, our paper money is backed by nothing. You might be saying, well, gold and silver, gold and silver. We'll get to that. Backed, sent, backed securities with gold or silver makes for a much more stable economy, disallowing the government from overspending and causing families harm by a reckless and selfish policy of greed. Real capitalism will cause the federal government to shrink because it will no longer be able to control a rogue policy of self-enrichment at the expense of the taxpayers and their families. The federal government will have to learn to live within its means like citizens must live within a budget. The Charter Bank will replace the central bank, a.k.a. AKA Federal Reserve System. And that's what Kennedy wanted to do, which is why they just would kill him. And Mr. Ball and all you Make America Great people, 
you truthers, this is never going to happen. The Federal Reserve, the Jesuit Bank, is not going to be collapsed or closed or whatever. Our dollar, that means nothing. It's only by the grace of God that it still has any working whatever. But a charter bank to replace the Federal Reserve? People, America is a Jesuit nation. It's never going to happen. Okay? The boom and bust cycles in the history of the nation is over. Economic prosperity for America will be measured in real dollars backed by gold or silver instead of nothing. Amen, if that were possible. The national debt will be gone, and the dawning of a new era in funding will begin. War bonds, saving bonds, treasury bills, all have their place raising money for worthy causes and investments for the people. Eminent domain is the taking by government, your money, property, family, and freedom. And amen. It is. It is. But now, gold and silver. You read, you hear a lot about gold and silver. We're not done. We're still going to read about the Titanic. We're not done yet. But turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Proverbs. To Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. Verses 1 on to verse 7. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and, depart, and to depart from evil is understanding. Job 28, 28. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. Hinge this verse. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. Uh, but righteousness delivereth from death, the righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. Hmm. The righteousness of the, right, of the righteous shall deliver them, but transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of unjust men perisheth. For the love of money is the root of all evil. For which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. First Timothy six, chapter six, verse ten. Gold and silver. Well, gold and silver. You hear when the economy falls today, gold and silver is your answer. Yeah, you're gonna go to a grocery store with a bar of gold and barter for groceries. What's the exchange gonna be? No, dear friend. Well, gold and silver is scriptural currency. Amen, amen. But see, you got to remember, Satan's goal is to have everyone take a mark in their right hand or in their forehead that they might not buy or sell save they who had the mark of the beast or the number of his name. Okay? So, gold and silver will be manipulated. But we see in Scripture, Ezekiel chapter 7, Verses 16 on to verse 19. Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 16 on to verse 19. Okay? But they that escape of them shall escape, and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, all of them mourning, every one for his iniquity. All hands shall be feeble, and all knees shall be weak as water. They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth, and horror shall, co and horror shall cover them. And shame shall be upon all faces, and baldness upon all their heads. They shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord wrath. 
in the day of the wrath of the Lord. Now, this was somewhat fulfilled already upon uh, Israel, Jerusalem, when they were totally taken out of there by Nebuchadnezzar, but for future po uh, prophecy. Gold and silver in the time of Jacob's trouble, after we, the church of the living God, are taken out. Gold and silver is not going to merit you, profit you anything, people. Today, if the dollar were to cl uh, collapse, okay, the fiat currency were to become toilet paper, what are you going to do? You're going to go to uh, a grocery store with a thing of gold? Let me buy groceries? What's the exchange going to be? How is that grocery guy going to, how is that going to work? It's not. It's not. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. Future uh, prophecy here. Yes, this has already been partly fulfilled with the devastation and destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, but this also holds for future prophecy. Gold and silver will profit you nothing in the time of Jacob's trouble. People call it the Great Tribulation. Not so, according to uh, Scripture, Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? Gold and silver, silver will not profit you in those days. James chapter 5. James chapter 5, which is specifically addressing the time of Jacob's trouble. Because the book of James is written to who? Jews. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes, the twelve tribes of Israel, who are Jews, which are scattered abroad, greeting. The book of James is written for the Jewish people during the time of Jacob's trouble. As is the book of Hebrews, written to the Hebrews during the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Doctrinally, Hebrews and James is written for the time of Jacob's trouble. There is doctrine within them that does cross dispensational lines, but in its in its totality, Hebrews and James is specifically more for the Hebrews, the Jews, during the time of Jacob's trouble. But James chapter 5, James chapter 5, verses 1 on to verse 3. Time of Jacob's trouble. Midway during the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, that man of sin, the son of perdition, inaccurately referred to as the Antichrist, is going to make all, uh, uh, not force them, but uh, everyone who wants to buy or sell needs to get a mark in their hand or in their forehead. And once you take that mark of the beast, you're going to hell. No ifs, ands, or buts. You can't do like what uh, Robert Breaker or Gene Kim, John MacArthur say, cut it off or lop it out. You, no, once you take that, you're going to hell. No ifs, ands, or buts. And see, this is what these ecumenical scum, these easy believism heretic devils, they want to have you who get left behind to take that mark of the beast. That's their end game. But as far as gold and silver is concerned, See, this is the last days, people. The time of Jacob's trouble is coming. We, the church of the living God, are going to be redeemed, caught up. Before that happens, you can escape this time coming. But you need to get saved. You need to come to our Lord Jesus Christ broken, contrite, and in fear call upon the name of the Lord. If you don't do that, you're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. And hopefully you'll be part of that a uh, big multitude that gets saved in the early part of the time of Jacob's trouble and gets killed. Because you'll realize that people like Smiley up in Canada is lying to you. You'll realize that the ecumenical love gospel is of Satan himself. You'll realize that we of the Church of the Living God who adhere to the scriptures have been telling you the truth all along. God help you. James 5, verses 1 under verse 3. Go to now, ye rich men. This is for the time of Jacob's trouble. Weep and howl. Instruction and righteousness, yes. There is doctrine that, uh, that crosses dispensational lines, yes. Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted 
and your garments are moth-eaten because you got to take the mark of the beast during the time of Jacob's trouble. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. Gold and silver can't rust. Uh, no, you're right. Meaning that they're worthless not being used. They can't be used because the mark of the beast has to be implemented. And if you have gold and silver, why need the mark of the beast, right? Gold and silver is going to profit you nothing. Today, right now, yes, it can. But when our dollar collapses, when it does, and, and during the time of Jacob's trouble, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. All your gold and silver, you gold and silver buffs, when our economy falls, you know, there are several of these guys who are like, ah, when the dollar goes uh, bunk, I got my gold and silver. How are you going to buy a pack of bubble gum with that? How are you going to go to the gas station to put, here, I got that. Put that, can't do it. During the time of Jacob's trouble. Read Revelation chapter 13 and 14, people. It talks all about the mark of the beast and the consequences for those, if any man take it. During the time of Jacob's trouble with the mark of the beast, gold and silver cannot be an option or else why would Satan want to implement the mark of the beast? Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. Come on. Go on to Isaiah. <laughs> Don't use this uh, set of scriptures that much. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 10, on verse 20. Here's some, here's some good warning and instruction in righteousness. For those of you who are lost, thinking that Trump, when he comes, well, they're going to bring him back for an encore performance, just like the Jesuits did with Napoleon Bonaparte. You watch. You watch. Here's some warning to you. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 10 and verse 20. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. These men who boast themselves in their riches, who are part of these banks to build gates, the, all, all these millionaires, these Christian millionaires, yeah, like my lost father, who's, uh, he's a Christian, but will be the first one to boast of you about how he's a millionaire. Yeah, yeah. You shall know them by, by your fruits. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Yeah. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. What are you putting your faith in in person? Spirit, soul, body. The coming of Trump again? Because remember, he has the Cyrus anointing. Oh, you wicked charismatics. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon, that are high and lifted up, and upon the oaks of Bashan, their trees are being likened on the people who are high and lifted up, lifted up in their pride and their wealth and their things of the world. And upon the high mountains and upon all the hills that are lifted up, again, mountains and hills in that context being likened on to people who are set up, who are doing well. And upon every high tower, and upon every fence wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all the pleasant pictures. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish, 
and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold which they made each one for himself to worship to the moles and to the bats. And this is talking about verse, from verses 10 on to verse 20. Also, future prophecy fulfilled in, uh, fulfilled in part, yes, by the first uh, exile to Babylon by Israel, yes. But future prophecy still to be um, lived out. Yet coming. Gold and silver, dear friend. It's not going to prop, uh, profit you during the time of Jacob's trouble. The Federal Reserve Bank, which our, uh, Mr. Ball here was talking about. Federal Reserve Bank is the Jesuit bank. I'm going to prove it to you. Bill Hughes, The Secret Terrorists. This is a very good book about the Jesuits. The quality and make of the book itself is atrocious, but um, the quality of it, uh, of its contents is very, very good, okay? I'm actually going to be reading this entire thing in its entirety uh, onto you, okay? So, let's see. Pause that and read it, right here. Pause that and read it. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, oh, sorry. Pause that and read it. You know, Take a screenshot of it and zoom in, okay? Pause that and read it. And... Pause that and read it. Now, in the documentary that I'm going to be linking in the description box here, they talk about the Titanic. And, you know, you when I first heard about the Titanic being sunk by the Jesuits, it, it's like, what? The sinking of the Titanic. When we think of events that have transpired in history over the last 100 or 200 years, there are certain events that stand out as ones of great horror great surprise and great sadness. Of the many that come to mind, the most devastating have been the destruction of the World Trade Center in New York City, 9-11, which was uh, orchestrated by the Jesuit order, and the sinking of the Titanic. Look at what the Jesuit-controlled government here in America implemented after 9-11. Look what the Jesuit order implemented here in America after the sinking of the Titanic. Coincidence, I'm sure. The greatest tragedies in the last 200 years can be traced to the Jesuits. We will now show that the Jesuits planned and carried out the sinking of the Titanic, and we will show why they did it. Since the early 1830s, America did not have a central, a central bank. Mr. Ball talked about that. The Jesuits desperately wanted another central bank in America so that they would have a bottomless reservoir from which to draw money for their many wars and other hideous schemes around the world. Yes, without the Federal Reserve, no World War I, II, Korea, Vietnam, so on. In 1910, Seven men met on Jekyll Island, just off the coast of Georgia, to establish a central bank, which they called the Federal Reserve Bank. These men were Nelson Aldrich and Frank Vander Vanderlip, both representing the Rockefeller Finance and Financial Empire. Henry Davidson, Charles Norton, Benjamin Strong, representing J.P. Morgan and Paul Warburg, representing the Rothschild banking dynasty of Europe. We have already seen that the Rothschilds were the banking agents for the papacies, Jesuits, 
holding the key to the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church. Rothschilds, Jesuits, yeah, traitors to the to their own people. Uh, uh, the Jews, yeah, the traitors to their own people. The Morgans were friendly competitors with the Rothschilds and became socially close to them. Morgan's London-based firm was saved from financial ruin in 1857 by the Bank of England over with which the Rothschilds held great influence. Oh, say, hey, you mean the Bank of England is also controlled by the Jesuits? <laughs> really? Thereafter, Morgan appears to have served as a Rothschild financial agent and went to great length to appear totally American. His, Rockefeller's, entry into the field was not welcomed by Morgan, and they became fierce competitors. Eventually, they decided to minimize their competition by entering into joint ventures. In the end, they worked together to create a national banking cartel called the Federal Reserve System. And the book is G. Edward Griffin, The Creature from Jekyll Island, American Opinion Publishing, page 209, emphasis added. These three financial families, the Rothschilds, Morgans, and Rockefellers, all do the bidding of the Jesuit order because of Jesuit infiltration in their organizations. They do whatever is necessary to destroy constitutional liberty in America and to bring the Pope to world domination. As we look back over the 20th century, we see how successful the Jesuits have been. They have continued to squander the wealth of America and continually attack its great constitution and civil, civil liberties. <clears throat> I just lost my place. Daily, the power of the Pope in Vatican City, Vatican City increases. One day they will achieve total power again. They will. The building of the Titanic began in 1909 at a shipyard in Belfast, the capital of Northern Ireland. Belfast was a Protestant haven and was hated by the Jesuits. World War I began just a few years later. The Titanic was one of a fleet of ships owned by the White Star Line, an international shipping community. Banking was not the only business in which Morgan had a strong financial interest. Using his control over the nation's railroads and financial leverage, he had created an international shipping trust, which included Germany's two largest lines, plus one of the two in England, the White Star Lines. And isn't it interesting that right now, today, as you and I speak together, that the... Um, the supply lines for the food here in America are starting to come under siege. There were a number of very rich and powerful men who made it abundantly clear that they were not in favor of the Federal Reserve System. J.P. Morgan was ordered by the Jesuits to build the Titanic. This unsinkable ship would serve as the death ship for those who opposed the Jesuits' plan for a Federal Reserve System. That's why they built the Titanic. The, these rich and powerful men would have been able to block the es establishment of the Federal Reserve, and their power and fortunes had to be taken out of their hands. They had to be destroyed by a means so preposterous that no one would suspect that they were murdered. Like, that's what's Sank the Titanic? What? And no one would suspect the Jesuits. The Titanic was the vehicle of their destruction. In order to further shield the papacy and the Jesuits from suspicion, many Irish, French, and Italian Roman Catholics immigrating to the New World were aboard. They killed their own. They were people who were expendable. Protestants from Belfast 
who wanted to immigrate to the United States were also invited on board. All the wealthy and powerful men the Jesuits wanted to get rid of were invited to take the cruise. Three of the richest and most important of these were Benjamin Guggenheim, Isidore Strauss, the head of Macy's department stores, and John Jacob Astor, probably the wealthiest man in the world. Their total wealth at that time, using dollar values of their day, was more than $500 million. Today, that amount of money would be worth nearly $11 billion. These three men were coaxed and encouraged to board the floating palace. They had to be destroyed because the Jesuits knew they would use their wealth and influence to oppose a Federal Reserve Bank, as well as the various wars they were being, that were being planned. Edward Smith was the captain of the Titanic. He had been traveling the North Atlantic waters for 26 years and was the world's most experienced master of the North Atlantic routes. He had worked for the Jesuit, J.P. Morgan, for many years. Edward Smith was a Jesuit temporal, temporal coadjutor. This means that he was not a priest, but he was a Jesuit of the short robe. Jesuits are not necessarily priests. Those who are not priests serve the order through their profession. Anyone could be a Jesuit. And their identity will not be known. Edward Smith served the Jesuit order in his profession as a sea captain. Many interesting points about the Titanic are discussed in a videotape made by National Geographic in 1986. The videotape is entitled, The Secrets of the Titanic. When the Titanic departed from southern England on April 10, 1912, Francis Brown, the Jesuit master of Edward Smith, boarded the Titanic. This man was the most powerful Jesuit in all of Ireland and answered directly to the general of the Jesuit order in Rome. The videotape declares, and they mention this in the documentary, the vacationing priest, Father Francis Brown, caught these poignant snapshots of his fellow passengers, most of them on voyage to eternity. The next day, Titanic made her last stop off the coast of Queenstown, Ireland. Here, tenders brought out the last passages, passengers, mostly Irish immigrants headed for new homes in America. And here, the lucky Father Brown disembarked. Father Brown caught Captain Smith peering down from Titanic's bridge, poised on the brink of destiny. The Secrets of the Titanic National Geographic video, Videotape 1986. Here is Jesuit treachery at its finest. The provincial Father Francis Brown boards Titanic, photographs the victims, and these are the photographs that are well known. Most assuredly, briefs the captain concerning his oath as a Jesuit, and the following morning bids him farewell. Eric John Phelps, Vatican Assassins, Halicon Universe, Unified Services, page 427. Brown went over with Edward Smith one last time exactly what he was supposed to do in the North Atlantic waters. The Jesuit general, general told Francis Brown what was to happen. Brown then tells Smith, and the rest is history. Edward Smith believed that the Jesuit general, and this is for all these coadjutor devils and all of you who work for them, Edward Smith believed that the Jesuit general is the god little g of the Jesuit society, and nothing but his electric touch can galvanize their dead corpses into life and action. Until he speaks, they are like serpents coiled up in their wintry graves, lifeless and inactive. But the moment he gives the word of command, each member springs instantaneously to his feet, leaving unfinished whatsoever may have engaged him, ready to assail whomsoever he may require to be assailed, and to strike wheresoever he shall direct a blow to be stricken. R. W. Thompson, The Footprints of the Jesuit, 
Jesuits Hunt and Eat. I tried to get that book. Yeah, we've experienced this. People lying dormant and low, all of a sudden, come up preaching the love gospel, attacking the brethren. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, boy, shoe fits. Edward Smith was given an order to sink the Titanic, and that's exactly what he did. By the command of God, the Jesuit general, it is lawful to murder the innocent, to rob, to commit all lewdness, because he, the Pope, is Lord of life and death, and of all things, and thus to fulfill his mandate is our duty. W.C. Brownie, Brownlee's Secret Instruction of the Jesuits, American and Foreign Christian Union, page 143. Secret Instruction, the Secreta Monita. Link for it is on the channel. There is no record in history of an association whose organization has stood for 300 years, unchanged and unaltered by all the assaults of men and time, and which has exercised such an immense influence over the destinies of mankind. The ends justify the means. is his favorite maxim. And as his only end, as we have shewn, is the order. At its bidding, the Jesuit is ready to commit any crime whatsoever. G.B. Nicolini, The History of the Jesuits. Let us remember the oath that every person takes to become part of the Jesuit order. I should regard myself as a dead body, without will or intelligence, as a little crucifix which is turned about unresistantly at the will of him who holds it as a staff in the hands of an old man, who uses it as he requires it, and as it suits him best. R. W. Thompson, the Footprints of the Jesuits. When a person takes the Jesuit oath, he is bound to his master until the day he dies. Omerta. Edward Smith had become a man without will or intelligence. He would commit any crime the order wanted him to commit. Edward Smith had been required for martyrdom on board the Titanic that night. Edward Smith knew his duty. He was under oath. The ship had been built for the enemies of the Jesuits. After three days at sea, with only one pair of glasses for the bridge, Edward Smith propelled the Titanic full speed ahead, 20 knots, 22 knots, on a moonless dark night through a gigantic ice field nearly 80 square miles in area. Edward Smith did this despite at least eight telegrams warning him to be more cautious because he was going too fast. Did Edward Smith need one caution? No. He had been tra traveling those waters for 26 years. He knew there were icebergs in that area. But eight cautions did not stop this man, who was under the Jesuit oath, and under orders to destroy the Titanic. The movie, The Titanic, makes it seem like he was under pressure from his broth, his boss, uh, Ismay. But no. No. See, um, uh, predictive programming, uh, distraction, okay? That disgusting movie about the Titanic, okay? No. Edward Smith was a coadjutor working for the Vatican. The absurdity of warning veteran Captain Edward Smith repeatedly on Titanic's tragic night slow down is nothing short of preposterous. The fact that Smith never listened or heeded the warnings is, is, is insane. He had been given orders from his God in the Vatican. Just like every single one of you devil coadjutors here on YouTube out there who like to threaten me. Yeah. And nothing would turn him from his course. The encyclopedias paint a very tragic picture of Smith in his last hours. When it came time to give the order to load and lower the lifeboats, Smith wavered and Smith wavered, and one of his aides had to approach him for the order to be given. Smith's legendary skills of leadership seemed to have left him. 
He was curiously indecisive and unusually cautious on that fatal night. Are these words to describe a legendary sea captain with 26 years of experience, or are these words to describe a man who was struggling in his mind whether he should do his duty as a sea captain or obey his master who told him to sink the ship? John Jacob Astor's wife got into a lifeboat and was saved, while John Jacob Astor perished in the waters of the North Atlantic. There were not enough lifeboats, and many of them were only half full with only women and children. To prevent nearby uh, freighters from responding with help, distress flares were white when they should have been red, and they mentioned that in the documentary. White flares to passing freighters state that everybody was having a party. And you see the movie? Uh, yeah, white flares and a, a lady in the boat in the movie are like, oh, fireworks or something like that. Coincidence. One of the greatest tragedies of the 20th century, the sinking of the Titanic, lies at the door of the Jesuit order. The unsinkable ship, the floating palace, was created to be the tomb for the wealthy who opposed the Federal Reserve System. By April 1912, all opposition to the Federal Reserve was eliminated. In December of 1913, the Federal Reserve System came into being in the United States. Eight months later, the Jesuits had sufficiently had sufficient funding throughout the Federal Reserve Bank to begin World War I. A book in scripture that I really like to read that I think really, really, really hits home to tell us about the Jesuit order. Jude. Book of Jude. Verses 3 on to verse 19. Then we'll be done. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains, under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed. Uh, yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, "The Lord rebuke thee." Get that about verse 9. You've got these uh, charismatic people saying, I rebuke you in the name of... No, 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 no. Uh, not even Michael the archangel would bring anything against Satan. But he said, the Lord rebuke thee. But these, who are these? These men that crept in unawares, who were of old, who were before of old, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men? But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally, unregenerate, as brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, 
and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Corey. These are spots in your feast of charity. Well, they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about with winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. It is the tale told by an idiot, so, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Macbeth, Act 4, I believe that is, William Shakespeare. And Macbeth was written about the Jesuits. Mm. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints, to execute judgment upon all. Oh, God's a God of judgment. Oh, gee, imagine that. And to convince all that are ungodly, among them, of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. So God's judgment is there to convince those who are ungodly of their ungodly deeds. So asking for God's righteous judgment upon the wicked that that judgment might bring them to an awareness, uh, aware that their deeds are ungodly, that they're lost, and they might need to be saved? Really? You don't say. These are murmurers. Oh, let's read that again. To execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them, among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of, of, of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual, led by their five senses, as Manly Palmer Hall talks about, and uh, as in the um, spiritual exercises, yeah? These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. I, I believe that uh, the book of Jude really, really showcases well the uh, Jesuits. Uh, I, I really do. I really do. I really do. So there you go. <laughs> um, my American countrymen, people, your only hope is to be saved of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. To come to Him on His terms, broken, contrite, and in your brokenness of your self-righteousness, and contrite, having godly sorrow, because it's your fault that He went and died on the cross. And in fear of hell, in fear of standing before a righteous God, in light of your own guilt, you call upon the name of the Lord, and may He save you. And if He does save you, He will make you a new creature. That is your only hope. America is not coming back. What Mr. Ball said sounds good, but it's not happening. America is done for. We have here in America President Kamala Harris and her front man, Smoking Joe, established, ordained of God for judgment against this nation. Could America return to be a great nation? No. America would have to... Get rid of abortion. Sodomy. Look at the news media. And remember what the Kennedy said when we started this thing? Look at the media today. Look at the censorship that happens on this platform. Not on other platforms, but... He who now... Second Thessalonians, 
chapter 2, okay? Second, I can't see that. Second Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 6 on to verse 8. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be re revealed in his time. For the mystery of, a, of, iniquity, of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, letteth his hindering, will let until he be taken out of the way. God is omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. He knows everything. He's not going anywhere. The he that is being referred to is we, the church of the living God. We're not Christians. I'm not a Christian. I'm of the church of the living God, okay? We, the church of the living God, are the ones withholding. Our Lord working through us is what is withholding Mystery Babylon from obtaining true power. Once we are taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Who is that? That man of sin, the son of perdition, inaccurately referred to as the Antichrist, who is going to be a Jew, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. I know, we're reading till verse 12 now. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. And there it is right there. You want to believe that America is going to be great. You want to believe that good days are coming so you can go back to normal. It's not going to happen. You don't want to believe the true God of the Scriptures, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. No, you want to believe in, you know, just believe, you save yourself by your belief, or God loves everybody, everybody's going to be saved, God's love is unconditional, preach the love of God. That's not the God of the authorized version of the scriptures. That's that man of sin, the son of perdition. I invite you to come unto our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, through the scriptures. Like I said, a link for um, you and me to talk together, you and I, to reason together, will be in the uh, description box. I do hope you watch it. Take heed, people. Because these infiltrators and these people who are revealing themselves to be working for the Vatican are coming out in droves. Be aware. Cling to our Lord Jesus Christ and cling to the Scriptures. Please get saved before it is too late. That is going to be it for this video. Um, I had thought of maybe doing two videos today. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. But um, thank you so much for watching this if you do. By the way, sir, I wear this better than you do anyway. Besides, I got tired of shaving. So, thank you for watching if you do. Please continue to pray for us because... Um, my wife, your sister, she's not getting better. She's not getting worse, but she's not getting better. I'm pleased that the Lord uh, may continue to do as he has always done. Despite the threats and all these enemies trying to um, turn everybody against us. Thank you. We love you, Church of the Living God. May our Lord bless every single one of you, of the Church of the Living God. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your gifts. We love you. I will see you in the next video.